Good morning. Happy Monday. Uh, welcome to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to this community, this space. Our goal is to show up and help you develop that habit of getting into Scripture every day. Of course, we also hope that you fall in love with Scripture too. My name is Rebecca Palmentier. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here at the Scripture Habit. I say welcome. And today we are starting a new study. Boop, boop, boop. I'm really excited about it. I hope you are too. That's right. We're going into first and second Timothy. Yeah, this is a letter, a pastoral letter written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy. We're going to talk about it. Today is all about laying this groundwork so that we understand context. Good morning, John. Good morning, brother. Good to see you. All right. I'm waiting just a second for friends to join us in the live. Go ahead and comment. Let me know that the signal and everything is good. Ooh, and I was going to share this on my page. Let me do that really fast. Hi, Darlene and Susan. Yay, I'm so excited that signal's good. Awesome, guys. If you are with us, if you hit share now, it actually allows your friends to join you during the live, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to share real fast. Share. Hey, friends. All right, there we go. All right, Gloria, good morning. Melanie, good morning. Cool, let's pray. And then we're gonna start talking about our new study. Yeah. Good morning, Lord. God, you are so good. You are. We, we wake up just as the sun rises. Um, our sight turns to you, our hearts turn to you. We say good morning. You are worthy of praise. Help us get into your word today. Help us really hear the heart you have for your church. Help us, Lord, in your name, amen. Amen. All right. Okay, guys. Judy, good morning. Judy sent me this message like, oh, I can't wait to see what we study next, right? First and second Timothy. Super excited to talk about this. And look, I made a graphic. Isn't that fun? Um. <clears throat> We're in First and Second Timothy. We're going to be talking about that, um, the ruins right there. We're actually going to talk about that today. It's pretty cool. Uh, this is a verse by verse inductive approach. Um, I thought I'd just take a minute and just talk about why we are studying the way we are, because there's different approaches to uh, to coming at Scripture and seeking to understand. Uh, hi, Rita. Good morning. So, really quick. An inductive study approach is this investigative way to understand scripture before drawing conclusions. When you are approaching scripture inductively, you're asking questions. Who wrote this? Who was it written to? When was it written? Culture factors of the day that are relevant for proper interpretation. What are those? The goal is to understand the message as it was originally intended. I think that's so, so important. There's lots of other ways to study the Bible. Um, you know, you could do a, a theme study. We've done on occasion a theme study. This is really my favorite because I feel like when you, when you ask those questions, I love asking those questions. It really helps me, I think, see the message as it was intended, much better. It's easier, especially when we look into some of these letters uh, like Timothy. Uh, we're going to see some things that we would wonder, why is that there? What is the purpose of that being there? But when you have this inductive approach where you're looking at who's writing, what, when and why is it being written, the communities that it's being written to, it makes so much more sense. It's very consistent. Yeah. So that's our approach, guys, if you never knew that. We study verse by verse inductive Bible study. Yeah. Okay, first Timothy background. Let's set just a little bit of background. The Apostle Paul is the who that wrote it. And he was writing to his, I, I call him a protege, but Paul uses the word son in the faith or true child of the faith. We're going to see that today. This guy named Timothy. Timothy was a, yuch, a much younger man. I just made up a word, yuch. A much younger man than Paul. Timothy actually came to Christ through Paul's ministry. His grandmother and mother 
also accepted Christ and supported Paul. And as Timothy, you know, grew in the faith, he really followed Paul as the spiritual father. Timothy ended up, he ended up um, joining Paul. As Paul traveled to various locations, Paul often sent Timothy as a representative when he himself uh, was unable to go. I just wrote able, it should be unable to go. A lot of times, one of the things that people point out most often about Timothy is that he was a younger guy. And so Paul was speaking to him about, you know, how to be a, a rising pastor, a, a spiritual leader when you're still kind of young. Yes, there's there's more to it than, than this, though. It's really good. Darlene, are you understanding more? Yay. I'm so glad. So glad. With Timothy. Timothy was asked by Paul to take this lead role for the church in Ephesus. This is where there's some cool overlap, right? People might not catch or really understand the significance of where Timothy was. This is going to be a really big deal for us as we seek to understand the context and the issues that Paul was writing to in these letters to Timothy. The church in Ephesus. So the letter Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, that was written to the church in Ephesus. These two pastoral letters, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, sorry, they are written to this young man placed there by Paul to help guide this new church, to lead this new church in Ephesus. All right. The when this is happening, so likely around AD 63, it's this period right after Acts ends. Well, we see Acts ending where Paul is traveling to Rome, right? And he's going to be able to share the gospel with the leaders in Rome. We know, we believe after that he was released and then he had a little bit more work to do, but we do believe that he sent Timothy because he couldn't go to, Ephes uh, to Ephesus himself. There's some other things about Ephesus I can't wait for us to talk to. But as I wrote, the letter is specific instruction. The where really, really matters as we read this letter. That's why I'm taking a lot of time to point out to it today. So where is Ephesus? Well, cool side note, if you ever want to go on like one of those tours that visits ancient biblical cities, Ephesus is is a place that you can tour it's no longer in existence it's a lot of ruins but you can still go there they do have tours that take you ephesus is in modern day turkey all right i put two pictures here man i wish i had a little cursor to point out to you but if you look at the map that's on your left i picked this one because i want you to see where ephesus is in relation to jerusalem all right so this, this area that is kind of marked out as Galatia, we also refer to that, that in a broader sense as Asia Minor. And if you were studying the prophecy of Daniel, you know we talked about Asia Minor, didn't we? Yeah. Greece. Greece. Yeah. Okay. So we see here Ephesus is this port city. It's on the Aegean Sea. And especially in these ancient times, one of the things we know about port cities is it usually means that their economies are better. And it also often means that their communities are much more diverse. There's a lot more things happening. Why? Because it's kind of this epicenter of trade and economy for the region. And it's definitely the case for Ephesus. All right. So I, I like the maps there. I hope you like it too. Moving on. Okay, so Ephesus was originally established, we're thinking 1000 BC by the Greeks, but it came under Roman control in 133 BC. Ephesus is, was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Remember we talk about Rome, they would go and they would claim more territories for Rome. Um, they would still allow those cities or those peoples to exist as long as they weren't a threat, right? Hi, Bonnie, good morning. What we see here, um, 
really cool that there were roads from Ephesus that spread out pretty much in every direction from the city to the surrounding provinces. Again, that's not surprising because it was this port city, right? Also a diverse ethnic makeup. Some of those uh, ethnicities included uh, Lydians, Ionians, Greeks, a native population of Anatolians, a large Jewish consistency, and then in addition, Rome sent many of its citizens to its provinces as a colonial strategy uh, to protect the interests of the empire. Yeah, um, they didn't push people out as we've seen other colonial approaches where they remove the, the native people and then bring their own. Rome didn't do that, but they definitely brought their force there. So lots of cultures that are happening here. And remember, Rome and Greek are distinctly different. But I think a lot of times people's minds tend to overlap them. They are distinctly different. All right. We see Paul's visit to Ephesus in Acts 19. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks of fighting beasts in Ephesus. We're going to look at that and understand a bit more why. And we can see from Acts 19 that there was a serious spiritual struggle with magic, demonism, and worship of Artemis that was causing a deep headache for the church. I love these moments when we can overlap scripture, when we can see, again, to help us understand. And that's what I love. The whole of scripture works together. And so in Acts, remember Acts was like this um, storyline narrative. It was capturing the early church's development, right? And it includes the moment where uh, Saul met Jesus, became converted. He became Paul, right? We see a lot of this early church stuff. I want us to look, I actually want us to look at Acts 19 because I want you to see this is the community that Paul knows because he was there, all right? So he's been there, and there were some significant struggles that happened there. Those will definitely weigh on Paul's mind as he's now coaching Timothy on how to lead the church there, all right? You ready to look? You ready? All right. So in the very beginning, verses 1 through 7, I'm going to summarize. Paul arrived. Followers of John the Baptist were there. They had not heard of the Holy Spirit. So John the Baptist's message was one of repentance, right? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And John the Baptist would then baptize people, right? John the Baptist was the, the one that prepared the way for the Messiah, right? So just because they're John the Baptist's followers doesn't mean that they know the gospel. And in fact, we see that these guys didn't. So one of the first things that we see is Paul talks with them. They don't even know the Holy Spirit. And so Paul ends up sharing the gospel. They believe in Jesus. They're baptized then as followers of Jesus, and they receive the Holy Spirit. Pretty cool. All right. Summarizing verses 8 through 10. Paul ministered first to Jewish communities at the synagogues, all right? That was a common thing. We always see Paul did that. Whenever he goes into a city, he first shares the message to Jews, right? He always speaks to them first. Inevitably, they end up getting kind of hard hearts or they don't receive. Sometimes they run them out. So Paul then says, okay, I've shared the gospel with you. Now I'm going to turn and I'm going to tell the Gentiles about it. And we see that Paul did that here. All right. So when he became, when they became hard hearted, and that's my description, he moved to a Greek lecture hall. It's actually called a lecture hall of Tyrannus and continued sharing the message for two years. And these are the words of verse 10. So that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard Guys, I have so many typos in that. I'm sorry. It's heard the word of the Lord. He was there for two years. And the purpose of him sharing the gospel was that all of those surrounding areas would hear it. And how does that happen? Because he's in the city that has roads that go everywhere and people traveling everywhere. And when he shares the gospel there, people take it with them to the surrounding area. 
we see in Acts 19. He was there for two years doing that. There are some interesting things that happen, though. I, I'm putting verse 11 starts. It says, demonism defeated in Ephesus. That's the, the headline that the Christian standard puts in to like describe the next section. This is in Acts 19. I encourage you to grab it. In verse 15, uh, the, so there's this moment. We see Jewish exorcists are trying to use Jesus's name for their own power. They're Jewish. They don't believe in Jesus, but they see, obviously, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, right? Which they kind of started off that chapter with. They see the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, and they're like, that's powerful. So they start trying to use Jesus's name as if it's some type of spell or magic word that can help them exercise demons. This is the moment, if you're familiar with this passage at all, this man is possessed. And when one of these Jewish exorcists tries to use, to use the name of Jesus, the demon speaks back to him through the man. And he says, he says this, verse 15, the evil spirit answered him, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Someone uses using Jesus's name, but not in relationship with him. Doesn't have the power that comes with the name of Jesus. Because it's not just speaking the name. When you identify with the name of Jesus, it's submitting to that authority. It's honoring the authority of the name. And they weren't. Hi, Karen. Good morning. Bonnie, did I say good morning? Verses 18 to 20. This is this really cool moment. Many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. Why? They just saw this incredible thing happen, this manifestation with this guy who was demon-possessed, and, and it did not, not go as they expected, right? But they became very um, aware of Jesus and aware that these other activities that seemed spiritual were actually not consistent with him, right? So these people, many, it says, many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices, while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. They calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. I think they estimate uh, about $50,000 worth of supplies for this magic industry that is now being given up and burned. In this way, it says, the word of the Lord flourished and prevailed. Make this connection before you move on. That there are a lot of belief systems in Ephesus, but a really, really strong practice was this other seemingly spiritual, magical work. It was not consistent with Jesus, right? But it had a very strong presence. In fact, these Jewish exorcists are trying to blend the two, you know? There's, there's a lot of accepted behaviors and practices and belief systems here. There's more. There's more. Starting in verse 23. About that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. Remember the way is what they called the church back then. It wasn't, it wasn't actually called the church yet. They called it the way. Why? Because they were followers of the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? Verse 24, for a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. 
you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man, Paul, has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. Not only do we run the risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin, the very one all of Asia and the world worship. What they just casually dropped in here is another huge, huge awareness to the culture, specifically of Ephesus, and that's Artemis. But before we totally break out Artemis and talk about this, I want you to see what happens. So you see this guy here, name is Demetrius. He's watching all of these people take their shrines and their magic books and their supplies of all this other sorcery and stuff, all these other belief systems, and they're throwing it away. And the guy realizes, man, if this movement continues, I'm going to be out of business. And so he starts to form what we would see develop into a full riot. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion. And they rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. They grabbed them, guys. Although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent word to him, pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. Some were shouting one thing and some another because the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know why they had come together. Some Jews in the crowd gave instructions to Alexander after they pushed him to the front. So motioning with his hand, Alexander wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. When the city clerk had calmed the crowd down, he said, people of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis? and of the image that fell from heaven. Therefore, since these things are undeniable, you must keep calm and not do anything rash. This moment in Acts 19, I think is so good for us to lay this groundwork as we start to go into 1 Timothy, because we see these influences. We see sorcery and magic and demonism and this you know, trying to exorcism, exercise people. All this very seemingly spiritually energized stuff, but it's not Christian. It's not Jesus following. It's not God honoring. There's such a clear difference, right? And then we see this Artemis. So who is Artemis? Because you can see here, even as this crowd is like turning into a riot, what is causing them to get so upset is this threat to the goddess of, of Ephesus, Artemis. She was a, like this essential aspect of their identity as a people, of their identity as a city, and in their culture. So take a look. Sorry, guys, my nose is so itchy. Ugh. Okay, so understanding Artemis really quick. Artemis, by the way, the Romans called her Diana, but it was the same one. Artemis is considered a Greek goddess. In mainland Greece, she was considered a secondary Greek goddess, and they depicted her as a huntress with a bow and arrows. Ephesian views of her differ. She's a prominent deity. In Ephesus, identified most often with fertility. They saw her as like their main god, goddess. There was something very significant and they felt like they were special because 
of where they were and, and how they believed Artemis loved this space. Why? Because there was this great temple that was there. Uh, really quick, she asked for eternal virginity from her father, Zeus, and all her companions were also vir virgins. She punished any man who tempted to dishonor her in any form. There is a um, mythological story about a guy that like bathes or, or watches them bathe, and she turns him into a stag as this punishment. I point this out because we know that there were cults uh, Artemis was worshipped in other places as well as Ephesus. Um, but we know that there were some cults that were very devoted in that they were women only and they followed that same rule. They needed to be virgins. All the companions had to be celibate. In fact, they would only let men in if men were castrated. Yeah, it, it had that same... Uh, very interesting dynamic that was very women-led. In Ephesus, the great temple of Artemis, sometimes called the Temple of Diana, why? Because that's what the Romans refer to her, was twice the size of most Greek temples, including the Parthenon. It was twice the size of the Parthenon, guys. And it became one of the seven wonders of the world. What we see in the picture here. Um, this is this giant statue of her that is still in the ruins that you can go see today. And you can see part of this great temple, which is what's on that title screen that we use for our study. It became one of the seven wonders of the world. Okay. I point these out. I actually think we're going to stop there today. We're not even going to get into verse 1 until tomorrow. I want us to see this is the culture that Timothy is having to step into and lead a church in, which is going to be interesting for sure, right? He, he is respected as a church leader, but stepping into this space uh, is still very different, yeah? And then we also see that Paul has a very clear understanding of the culture and the concerns. He's experienced um, the beasts. Remember in, in 1 Corinthians 12 where he said that he fought the beasts in Ephesus? These beasts uh, were, were kind of this metaphor for these really big strongholds that he fought against when he was there, which we see in Acts 19. Yeah, this is going to be a really great study. First Timothy is going to bring up scriptures that you recognize. It's going to bring up some scriptures that you question, particularly about women. We're going to look at those. And um, But apart from that, it's a really great book to help us see Paul giving instruction to Timothy on how he can lead a church in this community well. And he gives some really specific advice. Yeah. Are you ready for that journey? Yeah. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that your word is consistent, that your word is good. And we thank you for these letters, these pastoral letters from Paul to Timothy. Thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to see and understand the context in which they were written. Help us ask the right questions um, before we come to conclusions. Help us ask the right questions to fully understand the message as it's originally intended. God, we love you. We give you praise. Amen. Amen. Hi, Karen and Jean. Did I say good morning, guys? Vicki, Flo, good morning. All right, that's it for today. Do me a favor, hit the share button. Now is the perfect time to invite people into this study because we're just getting started, right? In fact, we didn't even jump into verse one today. We'll start that tomorrow. Have a great day, guys. I'll see you. Bye. Hi, Susan.